When Shopify says you can sell anywhere, oh, they mean it. Woo, hold up. Just got a new sale. Order fulfilled and shipped. Inventory level's good. Whoa, Shopify doesn't mind if you're at sea level. Or on top of the world. Ah, oh, you can run and grow your business anywhere. Climbing mountains is never easy, but at least Shopify gives me all the tools I need for my business to hit new beats. Whether you're selling carabiners or crop tops, start selling with Shopify today and join the platform simplifying commerce for millions of businesses worldwide. We've built the platform so you can keep climbing and grow your business to new heights. With Shopify, you really can sell to anyone from anywhere. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Start selling online today. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash free 22. Shopify.com slash free 22. Shopify.com slash free 22. Internet connection required. Not available on mountaintops or seafloors. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. It's my music. You're listening to Music of the Mat on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to Music of the Mat, the podcast devoted exclusively to the music of pro wrestling. It's all part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. I'm your host, Andrew Rich. This is episode 151, and it's a taste of 2022. And today I am joined by a first-time guest here on the show. He is a contributor at Voices of Wrestling, as well as one of the hosts of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungy, also on the VOW Podcast Network. It's Fred Morlin. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing okay. Doing okay. Just trying to... This is the first day of the uh, bomb cyclone uh, that has struck the United States. So we're all huddled for warmth uh, as temperatures dropped uh, under zero. Yeah, we got a bunch of uh, rain and wind here uh, today. Um, no snow, thankfully, but uh, it, it will get colder for sure later on the weekend. Um, but actually, uh, Fred, this is not the first time we podcasted together. That is uh, because we were both on the classic TNA episode of Five Star Match Game a while back, which, uh, not to brag, but yours truly was the winner of said episode. But uh, you know what? Hey, we're all winners on this show, Fred, so it's going to be a fun time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I have not studied for this episode. I only listened to 10 songs, so. <laughs> You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah. Well, since it's your first time on the show here, Fred, I'll ask you this question. Uh, How did you become a wrestling fan? How did you get into it? I honestly have been a wrestling fan uh, pretty much as long as I can remember. Uh, Like one of my earliest memories is uh, when I was six or so going into a waiting room at an urgent care center and uh, being mystified by whatever this pro wrestling thing was with, I swear, Sting doing a stinger splash on somebody in the corner and just being like, what the hell is this? Um and uh, unfortunately, my brain has been poisoned ever since. <laughs> and Sting is still giving Stinger splashes to this very day. So it all ties together there. Of course, yeah. Any opportunity. Yeah. Um, now, has music played a big part in your fandom at all over the years? It has, actually. The, fir- the first CD I ever bought when I was a kid, I was about 12, uh, was WWF The Music Volume 2, which uh, I remember several songs on that vividly. Uh, I think it had the first Stone Cold Steve Austin track, but for some reason they had clippets of him like talking shit over top of it, um, which was truly a bizarre decision. <laughs> and uh, had a bunch of uh, bops on there. That was actually that was like the highlight, the the, the high water mark possibly of Jim Johnston's output. Um, like Ahmed Johnson's theme was on it, which was great, and. Uh, uh, I think the early Rocky Maya via Babyface theme, which was underrated. And... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at the song list here, and you got Undertaker, uh, Vader, Mankind, Psycho Sid, Ken Shamrock, uh, real real who's who of, of big names there. So, That's right. uh, yeah, a, a pretty good uh, first album, I'd say. <laughs> when the weakest name is like uh, Flash Funk, you know, that's pretty solid. So, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Well, um, well, today, Fred, uh, we are doing A Taste of 2022. Uh, it's our annual year-end episode where we look back at some themes that debuted this year in wrestling. And uh, what a year it was. Boy, oh boy. Uh, it's always a crazy time in wrestling, 
of course. But um, this year, I mean, you had Vince McMahon resigning from WWE due to sex scandals, uh, which is like the biggest story in decades. I mean, that alone will be enough to fill the crazy quota for this year. But um, you also had you know Triple H taking over the reins of power in that company and bringing back a bunch of people who got fired. Uh, Brawl out, of course. Uh, Cody leaving AEW, uh, Tony Khan buying ROH, the whole Kota Ibushi stuff in New Japan, and Jeff Jarrett jumping ship, and a billion other things. I mean, Shibata came back this year and wrestled Orange Cassidy on Rampage, and that's like the eighth or ninth craziest thing that happened this year. I mean, it's yeah. it's, it's never a dull moment, Fred, that's for sure. No, this was a wild year. Like, this will be really interesting to go back and uh, give a close look at in 20 years, especially because some of these things, you know, we don't even know the full fallout of them. Like, Vince is apparently trying to come back despite, like, any sane person seeing how that would be a terrible idea for himself and the company. Uh, we still don't really know, like, what the true fallout of Brawl Out is. It's bonkers stuff all up and down the way. And it never ends. I'm sure next year will be, you know, even more madness because wrestling, it can just, it can never be stable. It can never be sane and steady. It always has to be just crazy all the time, always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, even the little things like uh, the shift to in an NWA away from Aldis's vision to uh, something with Tyrus on top um, for whatever value that will give them, I guess. Uh, yeah. Just a uh, very interesting year all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as far as, like, personal highlights go, I'd have to say, you know, going to Forbidden Door is the big one this year for me. Um, I mean, that was just, like, a magical night and a magical show, and to be there live in the suite was just incredible. Um, what about you, Fred? Uh, any highlights this year you want to you mention? Uh, I mean, starting the podcast is, is a pretty big one, I'd say, so. <laughs> uh, I was not expected to uh, be asked to do a podcast, yet Tyler was foolish enough to do that. Um, <laughs> just kidding, he's uh, awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's been, um, you know, in spite of clap crowds and, uh, everything else, I think it's been a pretty good year of wrestling and, uh, yeah, I, uh, have not been able to go to a show live this year, but I will be at, uh, Dynamite in January, which should be a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, uh, just, I think it was, uh, at the first half of eight of the year for AEW in particular, I think was really special and, uh. You know, we got the FTR Briscoe's trilogy, which I think far exceeded anyone's expectations, even though I think everyone would also agree that those are two very talented teams. But I don't think anyone could have seen them putting on three matches that if you gave them five stars each, no one would really argue with you too much, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, I went five stars on two of them, so... <laughs> and the third one's not that far behind, so uh, yeah, p pretty, pretty good series, I'd say. Pretty good series, but... Um... But anyway, let's get to these themes here. Uh, again, this is a taste of 2022. I call it a taste because it's not a complete list of new themes that debuted this year. It's just a sampler. I can't cover everything, and I do have my own blind spots, of course. But uh, still, we have 10 big songs to get to here. And we'll start off in AEW, actually, with one of the people that they signed this year, Swerve Strickland, former AEW World Tag Team Champion with Keith Lee. And uh, Swerve's theme is by Swerve the Realist. Hmm, I wonder who that could be. Featuring Flash Garments, this is Big Pressure. Guard me, top rope, catch a vibe, catch a quick when I drive. Big pressure, I'm fine, in the ring you won't survive. Yeah, I swerve when I drive, yeah, I swerve when I drive, yeah, I swerve when I drive. So the good thing about being a rapping wrestler is that you can make your own themes, and that's what Swerve did here. Um, it's not a very long song, and uh, he doesn't really rap a ton in it either. Most of it is just Flash Garments doing the top rope, catch a vibe, I swerve when I drive part. 
and Swerve just does the actual two verses in the middle, but uh, still a pretty catchy hook and a pretty catchy beat and song all around, I'd say, Fred. Yeah, I think this is actually, like, of all the songs we listen to today, this is the one that sounds most like a song you would catch on the radio. Um, I, it actually sounds like something that someone would put out in the year 2022 as a popular song, and it, I think that helps it, you know, gives it a, a verve that other songs don't really have. Um, this is one of my favorite AEW themes. I think it's one of the strongest ones. I do think they might want to think about doing a stronger stinger coming in if you're going because i i've always noticed that like the the skr skr you know swerve swerve part uh kind of just blends into the audio mix on dynamite um but you know i mean i think the song itself is great Mm -hmm. yeah i mean most importantly it sounds like a cool song and swerve is a cool dude you know he he does have some strange choice of friends with uh Big Parker and the face tag dude, but besides that, you know, Swerve is supposed to have this, you know, cool vibe about him, and I, the song definitely adds to that. Uh, only thing that would make it cooler, in my opinion, is if instead of Flash Garments, it was Flash Gordon. Flash. Ah. That'd be pretty cool, Fred, I think. Uh, what would probably make it less cool would be Flip Gordon. Hey, folks. Got him. We have fun around here, don't we? Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you mentioned the stinger. I mean, um, we played the single version here on the show. The one on TV has the Whose House stinger. Oh, yeah. Which, I always forget I mean, about right, that. It, it does sound a little awkward in the mix, I think. Um, but I can see the thinking behind it, at least. Uh, so there's that. Um but, uh, but yeah, I mean, Swerve, you know, he's, I think, one of the best signings they've done this year in AEW. Uh, he's got a very, you know, bright future ahead of him in the company, I think, um, given his skill level. And um, my one curiosity is how this new group is going to play out with, you know, him and uh, Big Parker and the Face Tat guy. Because um, there are some big questions about their skill level, I think. <laughs> uh, but uh, then again, he has Rick Ross on his side. And Rick Ross has been awesome to EW, so there is that at least there, Fred. So <laughs> Rick, Rick Ross may not be allowed on a live mic on AEW ever again, though, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, the down, downside of that uh, segment. Um, yeah, if you asked me a week ago, I probably would have said that if Swerve was challenging for the world title as a top heel in a year, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I still think he has that upside. I just worry that he may lose a little momentum with... Uh, if these got two guys are just not up to it, which is kind of how I'm feeling after Wednesday night. Um, Parker Boudreaux, like landing one punch and then wiggling his arms everywhere um, over <laughs> yeah. and over, uh, which was just a bizarre super NXT mannerism. And then honestly, a guy that you could have told me was uh, like a rail jumper <laughs> as the, the former minor league baseball player, uh, whose name I've already forgotten. Um, I don't know. I feel like they're taking a big gamble there when you probably could have gone with some safer bets, but it'll be interesting to watch if nothing else. Mm -hmm. I I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Going to go now to New Japan Pro Wrestling and the theme of Rock Hard. Juice Robinson. Uh, Juice turned heel this year and joined Bullet Club. Got a new theme song too. This is by Kubrick and it's called Chosen One. Bullet Club. Four, 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 four. Chosen one. Wow! Wow! Now, now. Oh, wait a minute. Wrong song. Wrong song. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> um, this is actually a complete 180, not just from the Swerve theme, 
but from Juice's old theme, Moonchild. Uh, that was super upbeat, dancey music, which was fit for the flamboyant gimmick, of course. Well, now he's rock hard, and he needs rock hard music. And this doesn't go too crazy, of course, but it's still got the big, crunchy, wailing guitars, the drums, the bluesy vocals. I love his old theme, but I think this song is awesome, too. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how often we get a chance to hear it, because he's now signed to AEW slash ROH, and he has his own theme there. And uh, I believe he still does New Japan Strong, but that's not really a guarantee. Um, but regardless, I still enjoy this one quite a lot here, Fred. Yeah, this is a pretty solid theme. Uh, the biggest complaint I have about it is I don't think the vocalist is really up to the task. Their, their voice is kind of weak relative to how the song goes. Um, I would have uh, expected more of a belter, you know, um, maybe like a more of an Axl Rose style. But um, I, I think that the instrumentation on this is really strong uh, within the world of wrestling themes. And uh, I think it really stood out pretty well. Um, there is a line in the, I suppose, the chorus um of whoa natural born sinner whoa under dream weaver <laughs> which just, just i was looking at the lyrics of it earlier i was just very confused by that and have no idea what that's supposed to mean but okay mm, yeah i get like a biker vibe from this song which yeah. makes sense i think because you know juice looks like a biker nowadays with the vest and the sunglasses and all that but but you can still picture in your head like juice on a harley somewhere running into town you know devil in a black hat Silver buckle with the leather strap. All my enemies, watch your backs, because I'm running with a nasty pack. Like, it's one degree away from, you know, Sons of Anarchy, riding through this world all alone. It's a, it's a similar vein, I think, there, Fred. Yeah, it kind of gives me a... Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the... Um, uh, the uh, Doc Gallows, Carl Anderson theme, um, only with Oh, more Devil in Your Six, with, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with more energy behind it, which is appropriate. Um... But yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, really solid. Well, Kubrick also did the Good Brothers theme, so you're on the money right there, Fred. There well, you that go. <laughs> explains a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, again, great theme here. Um, references the heel turn, of course. I've paid my dues. I want what's owed to me, which was the impetus of the heel turn, you know. And um, references to Bullet Club with the stinger and the line, black and white, bone soldier, flag. But um, if you take that stuff out, you know, it's still a good heel theme. You know, it has that slower pacing to it for a heel walkout entrance, I think. So, um, yeah, thumbs up all around. My only concern is, again, not hearing it enough going forward. That's that's my main issue, I think, there, Fred. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's got a really good vibe to it. I think it works great as a heel theme. Yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking back, it was a, a pretty weird year for Juice, I think. Because, um, you know, towards the start, he did work everybody by making people think he was going to just, you know, leave New Japan and, and take a break from wrestling. But... He makes the big shocking heel turn and joins Bullet Club and wins the U.S. title. And it's like, all right, here we go. Here comes the big push. And then he has to vacate the belt due to appendicitis. Then he loses to Osprey and Finley in the G1. And then he goes to AEW and ROH. And that's that's it for him in New Japan pretty much as, as an actual player. So, yeah, very very strange. Very strange overall, I think. But um, hopefully next year it, it turns out better for him because I think he's a really good wrestler. And I think he could be a really good asset for, you know, Tony Khan and, and whatever company he's in, you know, in the future. Yeah, especially if they're slotting him into Ring of Honor, I think that could uh, be very beneficial for him because he could be a top of the card guy there. What, what didn't he have like an awful G one record this year too, which I assume is uh, secondary to like not re-signing with them. Yeah, I believe he came in uh, last in his block with like uh, four points. Um, I mean, there was a, a shorter field with like seven people in a block, but still, it's. Not what we were expecting, I think, at the start of the tournament for him, anyway. But um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, moving on now to theme number three, and it's a WWE theme here, and it's for the IC champion and leader of Imperium, Gunther. Yes, Gunther, the former Walter, in uh, more ways than one. There, <laughs> uh, Gunther had a couple new themes debut this year, actually, but his most recent one is by Def Rebel. It's called "Prepare to Fight." Gunther,
Okay, Death Rebel, here are the notes for the new Gunther theme we want. It just says Scary German Man. Yep, that's it. Go nuts. Uh, um, well, listen, I, I, I mean no offense to my Germanic friends out there, but uh, when I hear a chorus of people singing something loudly and in a scary tone in German, my Jewish spidey sense does start to tingle a little bit, Fred. I can't help it. <laughs> I, I can understand why. Uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> so so one thing, uh, I, I think that they found an early version of the music for uh, Christians at last theme and decided to reuse it. <laughs> which, good on them for saving money. Um, I, I also am very bemused by how much of the lyrics are apparently just about like establishing his name. Like, he is no longer Walter, he is Gunter, and we'll sing that over and over. Yeah, the lyrics, they're about as uh, standard as you can get, really. Um, Gunther, the Ring General. Gunther, the General has come to fight. Gunther, the Ring General. Gunther, the measure is there. Have the honor to fight. And that's it. That's the entire song, really. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it makes sense, you know. it. Yep. it he's big, scary, ominous Gunther with his impactful, scary theme song. It's about fighting... It all makes sense. The problem, though, is that you can't really help but compare this to, you know, previous Gunther songs, including the Gunther song, the Walter song, Symphony Number no. 9 by Dvorak. And, you know, it's just, it's not the same. It's too slick, it's too modern, and it doesn't have that sense of, you know, that sense of awe and majesty that the old Walter theme did, friend. Yeah, it's very, very uh, cacophonous, I'll say. There's just a lot going on, which seems to be the case with uh, pretty much any modern WWE themes. Um, uh, like, with this, I think it would have been better with um, just being an instrumental without the, the singing over top of it. But you have the singing, you have, uh, like, the bass cranked up to 12. Um, you have the, the I, I think synth strings rather than actual strings, horns, um, just all kinds of stuff going on on this track. Uh, and I actually, I, I like the instrumentation for the most part. Um, of course, comparing Devo to Dvorak, uh, as, you know, Greatest Symphony isn't exactly going to do this song any favors. But um, yeah, I think this, as far as a, a wrestling theme song, it has the backbone of a solid one. There's just, you know, in true WWE fashion, there just has to be too much going on with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it's for the best because, you know, by all accounts, Gunther and Walter are like two different people at this point. I mean, with the weight loss, he just looks so completely different. Um, and good for him for losing weight, don't get me wrong, but he just doesn't feel like the final boss that he used to feel like anymore. Um, even though he still wrestles the same pretty much and can still have great matches with like, you know, Sheamus or whatever. But still, there's, a, I think, a big divide between the Walter part of his career and the Gunther part of his career. And, and obviously, WWE storytelling and, and style and production goes along with that. But, um, but yeah, it's just, it's just so weird to see him like this skinny and trim, Fred, I think, that's for sure. <laughs> He's like the big Chongus meme in, re in reverse. <laughs> um, his uh, last, last Friday, he had a... Uh... A SmackDown match with I it was was it Ricochet if I recall correctly yes um they got some acclaim and it was like very good I actually thought that was like four and a half stars which by WWE TV standards is you know all time level stuff practically um and then it immediately ended and then they had Braun Strowman come out and chase him off and I'm like mm, yeah that's why I only parachute in for matches mm -hmm. at least they didn't give him the full name they were going to give him originally which was Gunther Stark. Which, oh, yeah. uh, for those that don't know, is the name of an actual Nazi. So, <laughs> they did dodge that bullet, at least, there, Fred. So <laughs> That was uh, the second time in the past few years that they uh, just decided not to use Google when they came up with a name for something after the uh, submission sorority attempt uh, <laughs> about eight, seven years ago. Yeah, that was another uh, whoopsie-daisy there. So, <laughs> um, Up next, we're going to go to Pro Wrestling Noah. And this theme is for the current GHC Heavyweight Champion, Kaito Kiyomiya. Kiyomiya got this new theme a couple months ago. It's by Osamu Suzuki, and it's called Regeneration. <laughs>
So we played Kiyomiya's old theme on a no episode a few years ago with Jojo Remy, and uh, that one was very much in the model of Misawa's theme, because Kiyomiya was, you know, modeling himself after Misawa for a while there, and um, now there's been a regeneration, because Kiyomiya in recent months has modeled himself after Keiji Mudo, uh, doing his taunts, doing his moves, and now he has a, you know, a very Mudo-like entrance theme. It does sound like a mashup of Hold Out and Trans Magic, two famous Mudo themes. So, um, it's a good song, don't get me wrong, it's, it's a good song, but if you know your Mudo themes, the influence is quite clear, I think, Fred. <laughs> yeah, I uh, am less familiar with those than I should be, but I do know this sounds very much like a classic 90s Puro theme to me from what I have seen and heard. Um, I, I do think it's kind of funny um, that there's practically two stingers on the front end of the song. Um, kind of reminded me of like some old like 2005 uh, Steve Carino entrances where it'd take him five minutes to come out uh, once his song started playing. But I, I do like the bass line on this. It feels like a Final Fantasy boss theme from like a Super Nintendo era game. Um, and it does have a strong kind of throwback theme, which uh, generally speaking is good. You can you know kind of question how great of an idea it is for Kiyomiya to try to pattern himself as Nudo 2.0, but... Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned 90s throwbacks. I mean, Osama Suzuki is the guy who made a whole bunch of 90s Burrow themes back in the day, uh, especially for New Japan, and he's also the guy who made Hold Out and Trans Magic, those two Mudo songs. So, if you're going for a throwback vibe, if you're going for a Mudo throwback vibe, why not get the actual guy to do it for you? So, you know, if you're someone like yourself, Fred, you know, the connections may not be that obvious... But when you do know he's the Mudo theme guy, and you see Kiyomiya doing the Shining Wizard and the Figure Four and the Perez Love Taunt and all that, it all, you know, comes together. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Also, it makes sense that they would go to the guy that did those themes that they wanted to have a sound alike, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, the good thing is, you know, even if you disregard any Mudo influence whatsoever, it still works for Kiyomiya as this, you know, classic valiant hero theme. Which is what Kiyomi is. He's the classic good looking, you know, go getter babyface, really. And it still works as well as a great contrast with, like, Kano's theme or Nakajima's theme. So, um, yeah, the Mudo cosplay and all that stuff, it's not ideal, especially considering Mudo made him his bitch really the entire time. But again, he was a Masawa cosplayer for years before that. So it's nothing new, I guess, with Kiyomi, I suppose. Yeah, and at least they shook hands. So. Yeah, after Kiyomiya had to literally chase him down, so well, you <laughs> there, know, is, it's not the there is that part that, of it, so... <laughs> it's not the process that matters, is it? Who could possibly look bad by chasing down someone for a handshake? <laughs> theme number five, and we played Juice Robinson's theme earlier. Let's play his wife's theme. Uh, this is for Tony Storm in AEW, former AEW Women's Champion there. Uh, also signed with the company this year, of course. Tony's theme is by Maggie Ruckus, featuring Susie Mojo, and it's called... Watch what's next. So speaking of heavy influences, I can think of two big ones here. Uh, first of all, Barracuda by Heart. Yeah. That seems fairly obvious, I think. And uh, the other one is Immigrant Song by Led Zeppelin uh, with a guitar riff. Dun, 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 dun. So very much a classic 70s rock vibe here. And, uh, and Tony's always had that, you know, rock chick vibe to her anyway, so that all lines up there nicely. But yeah, not a... Not an original sound by any stretch of the imagination, but um, still a pretty kick-ass song, I think, Fred. Yeah, I, I think this is one of Ruckus' uh, best pieces of work. Um, every time that Storm comes out, my, if my wife is in the room, she'll refer to her as Barracuda because of the 
sound of the, the similarities to that song by Hart. Um, I, I do think it's pretty similar in general to what Hart did too um, with the I think it was the Wilson sisters that made up that band but um, yeah I like this a lot uh, I really like the drums on this in particular um, the, the drummer is doing a lot of work here and I think it really fits Tony Storm's character in general uh, very well mm-hmm. yeah it's funny to think of it as like the flip side of Juice's theme which is also a rocker but it's slower it's moodier it's more heel leaning Whereas this is fast-paced, it's lively, it's it's definitely feels more like a face theme. Uh, even the lyrics, I'll follow the path that leads me to my dreams, taking a chance, I do it just for me, ringing out, fan the flame, drive ahead, take the day. If you saw what I did before, watch what I do next, watch what I do next. No more standing back, I'm owning it, it's my destiny. Like, it's the same sort of message as Juice's theme, you know, it's my destiny, I'm gonna make it my own, or whatever. Except with a a much clearer face slant to it, I think, Fred. Yeah, this is a tremendous baby face theme. Uh, I think it could also work as a heel theme. They'd probably want to rework it a little bit musically, maybe make it uh, you know a deeper tone or slower or something along those lines. But yeah, I, th- I think this is uh, really good work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, Susie Mojo, I looked her up. Uh, she is an indie singer from Florida, and uh, she sings the song, and her voice is heard every week on national TV. That's that's pretty cool, really, how it works out like that. And, and and cool for Tony to be in AEW as well, I think. Much like Swerve, I think she's been a great signing for the company this year. Um, just, you know, looking cool, being cool, having hard-hitting matches with, you know, Jamie Hayter and Akaro Shida. Um, it's a lot better than her taking pies to the face in WWE, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and I think a good business uh, move by Tony Storm to jump as well. Uh, I think she really bailed out the women's division this year with all the the aftermath of uh, the Thunder Rose, Rosa uh, drama that was you know leaking onto TV. Her coming in and uh, you know holding the then interim championship uh, no longer. Um, I think she really helped uh, kind of make everyone forget about all that and just kind of got the division somewhat back on track. And I think haters really you know, took the baton from her and is doing a lot of great work so far. Mm -hmm, Definitely, definitely. So going back to WWE here with our next theme, and uh, a lot of people return to WWE after Vince left and Triple H took over. Uh, Braun Strowman, Karrion Kross, Hit Row, Dexter Loomis, all the stars, all the stars are here. But we're going to talk about one man in particular, and that's good old Bray Wyatt. So... Get your QR codes ready, your Dakota rings, what have you. Bray's new theme he got this year is by Code Orange, and it's called Shatter. So I've made my thoughts about Bray Wyatt clear on this show. Um, I don't like him. I think he's a goofball and a bad wrestler and has some of the cringiest, you know, most awful segments ever. But, but, the man has had some great themes over the years. So, you know what? Give me a top hat and call me Uncle Howdy because the bastard's done it again. I really like this song a lot. I still don't like him, but the song is, I think, really good, Fred. As someone who has not watched a segment of his since he returned, just because I had no real interest in it, uh, do they use the whole instrumental intro for like on TV, or do they just kind of skip pretty quickly to the verse? 
I think he walks out during the intro and starts talking like right after it or like towards the end of it, but I'm not sure. So that is a long intro for a for a TV theme song. But I agree with you. I do think that this is uh, actually a really good song. Um, I still prefer his uh, Dirty Swamp Wizard uh, theme with the initial <laughs> run of the Wyatt family. Uh, I think that's one of the greatest wrestling themes ever. Um, I think this works really well. The end of the chorus um, w- uh, kind of reminds me of uh, Trent Reznor's vocals in the 90s, especially. And uh, I don't know, it has a very unique feel, especially when you get to the song. It kind of avoids what I feel like is a common issue with WWE themes, where there's just like, it's way overproduced with too much stuff layered on top of it. And I think this is a, a musical highlight for them right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I picked up on the Reznor and Nightingale vibes as well with the vocals. Um, and like you, I think what makes it work especially is that it doesn't sound like a typical WWE theme nowadays. You know, whereas Death Rebel, so much of their songs feel like generic modern production music, and they don't really stand out all that much, and they all have kind of the same sound template or whatever. This is an actual band who made an actual song on their own. It's it's Code Orange who did the theme theme, and it does feel unique to what you know WWE music sounds like nowadays. And yeah, say what you will about Bray Wyatt, but the man knows how to stand out in good and, and mostly bad ways, Fred, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think that, you know, just, uh, it's yeah, I think it's a great theme um, and uh, probably the best part of the character right now. Mm-hmm. And, and the lyrics are very much Bray Wyatt lyrics. You can throw it all away when things break, things shatter. Keep it written on your face. The little details matter. Only in me, I am the coil, I am the spring, I am the ghost in the machine. It's that same kind of poetic imagery that, you know, Bray loves to evoke where it sounds all deep and meaningful, but you don't really know what he's talking about either. <laughs> like, you think, okay, it's called Shatter. It's going to be about Bray being shattered and in pieces and he's not himself anymore and all that. But then they start talking about, like, you know, die for me, brother, love one another, use me for cover. The whole world's laughing. Like, what the hell's going on here? Like, it's like his promos. You know, you just you can't really pin down what he's talking about, Fred. I think it makes more sense than most of his promos. So there's that. <laughs> uh, there's at least some emotional uh, heft to the lyrics here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, it's more uh, I think impressionistic than not, which is uh, you know it works better in a song than a wrestling promo. Uh, just so, uh, just to share, because earlier I sent you a screenshot of how Genius.com recommended I go to uh, a Veggie Tales song while looking at the lyrics for Gunter's theme. Uh, this one is suggesting I go to either Face to Face by Juice World or The Twelve Days of Christmas. So, huh, well, quite the uh, spectrum of songs there. Uh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, um, theme number seven, and we're going to go now to Impact Wrestling. And uh, one of their big debuts this year was Speedball Mike Bailey. Back in the States after many years of being banned, uh, Speedball's theme is from the In Pictures Music Library. It's by Sergei Kolsov and Paul Thorne. And it's the instrumental version of a song called Where Do the Gone Things Go? So Bray's theme was very dark and moody, and, and this is also fairly dark and moody. Uh, very sparse, too. It's just that keyboard melody over the uh, backing beat there. Uh, no vocals, because it's an instrumental, um, and it keeps the same slower pace all throughout. So it's a pretty strange choice of song for someone like Mike Bailey, I think, because it doesn't really feel like it fits his whole demeanor. It feels a little too slow and morose, I think, but... I guess when you're picking from a library, you're not really getting that personal touch. Um, so yeah, kind of a kind of an odd one for Speedball here, Fred. 
Yeah, I think this is a case of just uh, the wrestler making the music rather than vice versa. Because Mike Bailey's had such a fantastic year, I think he's able to kind of get away with this really weird uh, match of a song, you know, that he comes out to. Like on his last uh, pay-per-view match, he's coming out and doing like a couple board break karate strikes before going to the ring while this goes wall and it's just like doesn't make any sense whatsoever um as a combined thing uh i do think that uh it, it feels very impact ish uh I, I can only really point to josh alexander's theme as one that i've heard a bunch this year that sticks out to me uh from them but it feels like that they have a bunch of themes that have this kind of vibe especially with what I can only refer to as like the movie trailer wah kind of <laughs> sound, which is the backbone of this song. And it kind of pops up in Josh Alexander's too, to a lesser extent. Um, but that's like uh, 80% of the song. Um, I do think the song would be a lot better as a theme song if it was if it was faster. If they just picked up the pace on it some, especially for Mike Bailey, since he works so frenetically. And is, there's hardly a down moment in his matches, but... Uh, you know, I also don't know what kind of a budget impact has, so <laughs> you know, I, I kind of not I, enough. I, for... I just... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I assume not enough to like you know commission something specifically for probably their most important wrestler this year. Yeah, not enough to uh, hire back Dale Oliver, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> but um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, with this song, I guess I can picture it as like training montage music with Speedball in a gym somewhere, just kicking things over and over again, and some wise old master looking on an approval or whatever, and I could see it in that way, but as entrance music, is just it's a little too somber, perhaps. Um, and also, it doesn't help that when I think of Speedball themes, I think of his theme in the Indies, which is Brass Monkey by the Beastie Boys, which is totally different than this one in every way, so, um, I mean, it'd be pretty cool if he had that song in Impact, don't get me wrong, but... I don't think Anthem has enough in the budget for that one either. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably going to be a little bit outside of their reach. Um, but yeah, that's uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't particularly care for that song as a theme for Bailey either because he doesn't feel very Beastie Boys to me. Like, he <laughs> feels very clean cut, and uh, the the band of "You Got to Fight for Your Right to Party" is uh, strictly the opposite in terms of attitude from how Mike Bailey presents himself right now. Um, but it at least uh, matches him better in terms of tempo. Well, he is a nice Canadian boy. I do agree on that. But <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, Speedball man, he had an amazing year. Um, I mean, not just in Impact, but on the Indies, uh, he was the clear MVP of WrestleMania weekend this year, and he just hit the ground running uh, when he came back to the states. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does next year for sure. Yeah, I think he and Alexander are really doing a lot to keep Impact relevant and. Uh... Hopefully he gets uh, you know, a main event push in the coming year because they've already taken the X Division belt off of him. And uh, you know, I think that that's just the only way place for him to go in the company. Up next is another New Japan theme. And this is for the son of strong style, Ren Narita, who returned to New Japan proper this year after an excursion in America for a few years. And he's been kicking some ass ever since. Uh, his theme is by Inosuke Kitamura. It's called Maverick. So Ren Narita is a no-nonsense, black tights, black boots, kick-ass kind of guy. So his theme song is also a very no-nonsense, kick-ass kind of song. Just a real simple guitar-based theme with some keyboard accoutrement in there. Sounds very old school and really sounds like a mix of some older New Japan themes in there too. Um, I hear Nakamura's theme in there. I hear Shibata's theme, obviously. 
I can hear Ibushi's theme in there too. So Narita is not just the second coming of Shibata, but he also has the sounds of classic New Japan themes in his own song as well. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very solid theme, um, but it's not spectacular. It feels like it's missing something to possibly make it really stand out. Um, but it's a it's a good driving beat, and I think it works really well for how Narita works and presents himself as a character. It feels like a preset theme from uh, Fire Pro Wrestling Returns. Uh, like, you would just be able to find that in there real easy and slap it on a, the creator wrestler. Yeah, it's almost like an outlier of a song, considering the gimmicks and themes that you know, a lot of recent New Japan guys have gotten when they came back from Excursion. Uh, you think of, like, Evil and his, you know, industrial metal gothic theme. You think of Rapunky 3K with their hip-hop theme and Hiromu's wild theme and Master Wato and Great Okan. Those are all, like, very distinct kind of, you know, wild genre songs, whereas this one is very straightforward, much like how Narita himself is a very straightforward guy. You know, he's, he's basically Shibata Jr., you know, so... Um, in that sense, it does kind of make Narita and his theme song stand out and be a bit unique, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. And I also thought of this. I can't help but compare it to Shota Umino's new theme, because he also just came back from Excursion uh, as the Roughneck, and his song is also a rock song, but that is very much in, like, the Tanahashi vein, as, like, the wild, flourishy, you know, high-energy guitar song, no pun intended, um, and Umino and Arita are very much being set up as like a Tanahashi Shibata dynamic, where you know one is the good-looking, flashy ace apparent, the other one is the serious ass kicker. So none of it seems by accident; it all seems by design. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how those two develop really going forward. I think, Fred. Yeah, that'll be really interesting over the next couple of years. I, I do think this back to basics approach for this song works really well within the. Uh... I guess the meta music environment of New Japan, uh, because it feels like everyone on the roster, their theme has some kind of flourish to it, uh, as you mentioned, and this absolutely does not. And I think because of the absence of that, it works. It stands out more than it would otherwise um, within, you know, the the environment it's in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I stress to people that if they've not gotten on board the Renarita train. Do so now, because he's already awesome, and he's going to be a big deal in the company moving forward. Um, I mean, he's in the finals of that TV title tournament at Wrestle Kingdom against Zack, so, um, and he'll likely win that too. So yeah, his, his future is very, very bright in New Japan, that's for sure. Yeah, I think he's uh, going to fit right in there and, uh, with a real push, and uh, with that coming, I think it's going to be, I think even 2023 could be a real breakout year for him. Mm-hmm. Second to last theme here, and we're going to go to Dragon Gate and talk about a stable theme here. Uh, the stable that debuted this year, Gold Class, which uh, started off with Kota Minora, Naruki Doi, Kaito Ishida, and Minorita. Uh, but now it's just Minora, Minorita, and Benke. Uh, this is by Akma, our good pals Akma, with the song Golden Classic. If I could describe this song in one word, it would be scintillating. This is a scintillating theme. You got the, the keyboard horns in there, they're flaring out. You got the fiery guitar rattling off from time to time. It's like I'm in a Spanish nightclub, burning up the dance floor on a hot summer night. It's a very, very catchy tune here, friend. Yeah, it's got a lot of bounce to it. Uh, I, I said the Ridden Rita theme sounds like a Fire Pro Wrestling preset. This sounds like the best preset you would find on a Fire Pro Wrestling theme. Uh, or game. <laughs> that this would be the one you'd be like, yeah, I'm glad they included this. I'm going to use this on like 18 guys. 
Um, yeah, I like this a lot. The guitar solo in particular is a lot of fun, I thought. Um, but yeah, I think this is just a really, really fun theme. Yeah, and the origins of Gold Class, by my recollection, is that um, Naruki Doi wanted to make a stable of hot boys. And he saw Kota Minora as the centerpiece of this hot boy group. So sexiness is very much part of the mythos of the stable. And the sexy theme song here plays a big part of that as well. So it's cool to see that link right there. And um, I mean, hell, it's Dragon Gate for God's sake. Sexy hunks is like a cornerstone of the entire promotion in its history. So, <laughs> you know, um, it all kind of lines up there for sure, Fred. Yeah, it does. Uh, but yeah, it feels right at home. Mm-hmm. And I love the aesthetic, too, with the, the gold robes and the gold gear and all that. It's a good-looking unit. And um, the song, actually, I was thinking about this, too. It reminds me in a lot of ways of Milano Collection AT's theme and the Italian Connection theme. That same kind of, you know, that zestiness, that, that spice of life with the horns and all that. So, um, yeah, thumbs up to Acma for this one, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I probably would get close to putting the path of this group. But, uh, yeah, it's very solid, very... Uh... It, it, it does well. Final theme of the episode here, and it's one more AEW song, and it's for that little scamp, Danhausen, who joined AEW this year. Uh, Danhausen's theme is by Mikey Ruckus, and it's called The Danhausen Show. So if any song could be described as a delightful romp, uh, it'd be this one. Um, of course, it's hard not to be a delightful romp when you base a song around the Munsters theme. Uh, but yeah, this this has you know campy '60s TV show energy all over it. I mean, I can just picture Danhausen being chased by a monster like Scooby Doo, you know. And I mean, it's called the Danhausen Show. The title alone implies classic TV theme. Um, so yeah, this song is, uh, as they would say, Fred. Very nice, very groovy. Yes. Uh, I just picture Dan Housen running with like a cloud of dust forming around his legs and his legs just popping out going in circles. <laughs> uh, this is this is perfect for uh, Dan Housen. Is, I think that might be the best theme that uh, Mikey Ruckus has been involved with. It's just, uh, I mean, great musically. It's got a great idea behind it. And uh, I think it does it a lot better than his, uh, what was Dan Housen's Ring of Honor theme. Uh, which I kind of half remember as just kind of having an idea similar to this, but not getting close to delivering it. Uh, I thought the piano in this was a really nice touch. Yeah, the piano is really nice. I like the vocals too. Very nice. Very evil. Yeah. You know, who do you love? Dan Housen. There's, it, it's a very playful song. All sorts of playful bits and bobs in there. And um, I have to give credit to Mikey Ruckus as well for not going the tequila route. Yes. Because that was Dan Housen's indie theme, Tequila. And instead he went for another retro sound. So, um, yeah, good on him for uh, not going the obvious way there, Fred. Yeah, and I think this uh, kind of style works a lot better than uh, than trying to either outright use or kind of mimic Tequila. Um, I feel like this will work a lot better for Dan Housen and AEW with the big arenas and everything. Um, I, it's kind of like, a, it's like a if Rob Zombie went pop kind of situation, I feel like. <laughs> Well, Rob Zombie did do the Munsters movie, so you're on the board there again, right. Fred. There you go. There you go. Um, but also, what debuted this year was an evil Danhausen theme at Full Gear on the buy-in, which uh, I think they said will not be released, unfortunately. But um, yeah, we got a normal Danhausen theme and an evil Danhausen theme, so uh, that's pretty cool, I think, Fred. Yeah, I'm curious if we'll get to see evil Danhausen ever again, or if that was just like a complete one-off. Uh, wasn't any follow-up on it, but maybe it's just going to be like a 
a once a year thing kind of with him where he just randomly freaks out and then murders everyone with a spike. Mm. Yeah, Danhausen, it's funny. If anything proves that Tony Khan is a good booker, it's the fact that he's got me to like Danhausen now. Because I used to not like him, and now I love him. <laughs> and and they use him in the right way as like a comedy goon with best friends in OC. And he does get these like little moments where he gets some offense in and, and beats up the bad guys, but not too much. They don't overdo it. So, yeah, Fred, I, I become Pillhausen. I love that <laughs> Danhausen now. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, he's. I mean, this has uh, probably been one of the best booked uh, characters on AEW this year. Like, he's just been slotted in the right place. He's been used correctly, and um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, just it's been a great year for uh, Danhausen, and uh, hopefully next year, you know, he'll get. I, I don't know how much more you want to feature him because, like, he's not. I don't think he's an act you can really push as a serious threat without him going completely super spooky, Danhausen. Um, which I don't know if you want to go either, but I think that what he's doing, like what he has done this year is fantastic stuff. And, uh, hopefully we'll get more of that in 2023 housing. Mm-hmm, for sure. For sure. Housing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's going to do it for this episode of music of the Mat. Thank you so much for listening. And, uh, Fred, thank you so much for being here and thank you for putting up with my post COVID voice. Um, I'm still dealing with that, but, uh, regardless, this was a fun time, man. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. You still got some like sultry singing going on on your show, so I think uh, <laughs> think the think the COVID voice isn't a problem. I think it turned out all right. It gave me some bass, some lovely bass in the mix there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, any plugs you want to give? Go right ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, I, as you mentioned at the start of the show, I co-host a podcast on the uh, Voices of Wrestling Network uh, called "The Good, the Bad, and the Hungry" with Tyler Fortis. Uh, we discuss uh, the latest happenings in AEW each week um and uh, just kind of review where the promotion's headed where it's coming from and what you know you can expect to see on the horizon and i think we have a special surprise coming on monday night uh, when we record our next episode that'll be out tuesday probably um so i you know if uh, uh we got Stu williams coming on and we're go- going to start a project kind of inspired by his uh dynamite dozen so i think that it will be a lot of fun all right looking forward to it definitely and um Music of the Met is, of course, part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network, just like the good, the bad, and the hungry. You can find all the great shows on there at VoicesOfWrestling.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Music of the Met. Follow me on Twitter at Andrew T. Rich. VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Discord for all discussions and comments. VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Donate for any donations. Just click the big Donate button beneath the name Music of the Met or Good, the Bad, and the Hungry. Either one's fine. If you donate, hey, thanks so much. You're awesome. And of course, rate, review, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and many other places. Fred, thank you again, and I'll see you around. Take care, Andrew. Happy holidays, everyone. All right, for Fred Moreland, I'm Andrew Rich, and I'll see you next time and next year on Music of the Mat. Take care, guys. Music of the Mat is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The songs used throughout this show are property of their respective copyright holders. Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. Make every moment more with FanDuel. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued and non-withdrawable free bets that expire 30 days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio. Go Live Date. Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the Go Live Date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER.